Okay, well thank you very much and I'd, I'd like to thank everybody at NRG for giving us the opportunity to, to talk and share some ideas uh, this morning or this evening depending on where you are in the world. It's a very interesting time to be involved in nuclear power where we've got such a dichotomy of, of interest going on around the world between some markets that are growing very rapidly and others that have, have taken a different decision regarding nuclear power, so it's, it's interesting. And what I'd like to talk about tonight is the, uh, the use of real-time engineering simulators and the value they play, not only in the traditional sense as an operator training uh, device, uh, but also from an engineering perspective. And uh, so, you know, how, how we're providing more value than just from an operator training perspective. I, uh, I'm sorry that my colleague Steve Friel can't be here, and I'll do my best to, to fill his very large shoes. Uh, before we get into the, uh, the details of simulation use, I thought it would be good to give you just a few minutes of background on GSE systems and our, our role uh, in the market, both from a training and from an engineering perspective, and a little bit of background in case you don't know who GSE is. First of all, we're very happy to be one of the lead sponsors uh, of the, the uh, Nuclear Training and Simulation Forum uh, for 2013. So GSE uh, applies over 40 years of what we call best-in-class simulation technology to create some new environments for both training and engineering solutions and really focused on what we're calling the next generation of energy operating professionals. As I said, it's an interesting time across the entire energy spectrum where we've got new capacity coming online. At the same time, in many countries, we have a very aging and, and workforce ready to retire. So at the same time where we've got demand increasing and the need for new workers, we have a, a shrinking workforce which creates uh, an interesting situation, and an interesting challenge for the industry to find ways and technologies to help solve that, that particular need. And that's what we're uh, trying to accomplish here at GSE. A little bit of the history in case you're not familiar with the name GSE, you might be familiar with some of the other names we've, we've gone by in the past. You know, we trace our, our history all the way back to 1929 and what we call the dawn of the simulation industry when perhaps one of the first simulators built uh, for uh, flying aircraft called the Blue Box was created by a gentleman named Ed Link. And we trace our history from Ed Link all the way through the Singer Company, S3 Technologies, and now GSE Systems. And on the bottom of the screen you'll see you know, some of the dynamics that have been happening in the marketplace you know, what's driving the industry, whether it was the first nuclear simulator we built back in the early 1970s. Obviously, the events at Chernobyl and Three Mile Island had a dramatic effect on the use and value of simulators. And as we moved into the 1990s with computing power increasing, you know, doubling on an annual basis, the ability to bring in more engineering codes uh, has really reshaped the use of simulation, uh, particularly in our market space. And now we're facing things like uh, growing capacity at the same time we have an aging workforce. So leveraging our simulation heritage, we're really focused in two areas. One is in training and a, and a very lofty goal that we have in changing the way the energy industry learns. If we go back and think about um, how we learn versus how the next generation of, of workers learns, there's, there's a dramatic difference. And we're using our simulation technology combined with other technologies regarding visualization um, and other learning content to provide what we hope to be you know, a faster, more engaging, more infect effective learning environment for the next generation of workers, getting away from the, the chalk and talk and providing hands-on experiential learning. Of course, the other application, again, because of the ability uh, to start integrating true engineering code into the simulators, we're now using in, uh, the simulator environment uh, not only for training, but for engineering design, verification, validation. And that's really where the, the, the topic of uh, tonight's or today's discussion uh, will head in a minute here. So as I said, as we try to change the way the, the energy industry learns, it's the application and the underpinning of high fidelity simulation, but being applied in some new areas, whether it's how to visualize what's happening inside of a reactor, so you paint that correct mental model for the, for the students, you know, in a, in a training environment, you're really trying to, to help the student picture what's happening in the plant. And if we can use technology 
to help make sure that not only do they they get the, the picture at the same time, but they get the correct picture, and, and that helps them understand these complex uh, processes and concepts a lot faster. And we also are using visualization for task-based training, whether it be equipment diagnostics, equipment fundamentals, plant walkthroughs, and things like that. We're very proud that uh, we have a very global reach in our company. As you see across the top, we have over 1,000 installations and 160 customers around the world. Obviously, all of that is not in the nuclear power. We also serve the thermal power industry, uh, the process industries for oil and gas, um, refining, chemicals, especially chemicals, petrochemicals. And we've got offices around the world in the, in the U.S., Europe, and Asia to support those activities. So jumping into the, the real meat and why you, why you dialed in here today, I wanted to talk about, uh, start with some of the uh, some of the things we've noticed, I guess, uh, as we've been out of the marketplace working with customers, applying simulation both from an engineering and, and from a, um, a training perspective. Obviously, the introduction of digital instrumentation and control is, is a key factor in the power industry, uh, more so probably for nuclear than in thermal power since it's been used in thermal power for many years. You know, as a new plant's designs and life extensions uh, come online, you know, the, the industry and equally important, the regulators' understanding uh, of these systems is really critical. So the real-time dynamic simulators playing a, a new role in, uh, in servicing those challenges of the market. So maybe in order to understand where we are and where we're headed, we take you know, one step back and look at where we came from. So if we look at real-time simulators back in the, the dawn of that age, back in the 70s, 80s, and, and even into the early 90s, uh, you, you know, we, we fully modeled uh, the, the plants, but simulation back then truly was as much an art as it was a science. Uh, the engineers had to find ways with limited computing power to figure out how to replicate that control room so the operator could tell no difference between the simulator and the actual plant control room. Often these models were what we call handcrafted. Um, another word is there was a lot of uh, engineering discretion and personality in, in the development of some of these models, and they were they were fine for the purpose back then, which was you know um, again replicating what's happening in the the analog control room or panel control room environment. Obviously today the situation has changed a little more. We're we're using a lot more higher fidelity technology. It's pretty much the same scope of supply as far as the level of, of detail regarding the simulation. But the tools we're using are, are totally different than they were uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago. We're now introducing true engineering grade models for thermohydraulics and, and reactor kinetics. We're using you know, GSE, what we call our high definition platform, the first principle models for all the other plant systems. And then obviously the, the digital control systems and the modern human uh, machine interface provides a lot more, there's a lot more information available to the, um, to the operator than there was in the past. So how you deal with that information uh, becomes uh, quite important. Some of the other critical issues, particularly for the new plants coming online or being designed right now, obviously we're introducing new technology that's never been uh, tried and, and tested. The new control systems and information systems are extremely complex and have complex logic and control. Um, the, the plant is integrating a lot of, I'll say, disparate technologies for the first time. So even though there is a push towards standardization of nuclear plant designs, uh, you know, the AP1000 uh, is, is a prime example where you still can have a nuclear island designed by one company and the the balance of plant conventional island designed by one or more other companies. So integrating all that technology is still a challenge as, as it was at the dawn of the, the nuclear age. In coordinating the technology between the providers uh, for the, the different units, ensuring that the technologies are integrated is, is a big concern. And obviously getting these plants online, generating power as quickly as possible is squeezing schedules um, in order to get a better return on investment, and we need to find ways of using technology to help achieve that goal. So what's the role of an engineering simulator? And I'll go into some of these in, in more detail. 
One is that we call it a, a holistic engineering verification validation platform, meaning you, know, you can see your entire plant. And oftentimes, a simulator may be the first time you see your entire plant operating you know, before construction and commissioning. So you know it's not a, a system by system uh, view of your plant, but it's how those systems work together. Obviously, it's it's well known that the using simulation for uh, verifying and validating the control system design and implementation. Human factors engineering is another uh, key use for simulators these days. And with new plants, we're talking about new designs, and therefore we need new procedures. So using the simulator to help. Uh, develop and then ensure that the procedures are going to uh, result in the, the plant operations that are expected. And then at the end of the day, you still have your ANS 3.5 training simulator, uh, but you actually have that available to your team a lot earlier in the construction process. And what we have found is that, uh, even to our surprise, the simulator uh, really is on the critical path for new plant design. You know, the, the need to have licensed trained operators, the need to have licensed trained instructors to train those operators drives the need for that simulator a lot earlier in the, in the plant design and construction process than I think anybody anticipated you know, a few years back. So if we're going to be using simulators to, to really test out uh, many aspects of the plant, we also need to ensure that the technology we're using uh, is robust to, to match that task. So we are, are using several different, uh, I'll say, industry standard or very well industry recognized technologies. So for the uh, reactor thermal hydraulics, you know, we use a real-time implementation of the Idaho National Lab Relap 5 3D model. Uh, we use the Studsvik Simulate the Neutronics model when we're doing severe accident uh, design or severe accident modeling for containment, spent fuel pool, and, and those uh, instances. We use uh, EPRI's map code. And then GSE has its own suite of high fidelity, high definition tools that we use for the balance of plant, uh, dynamic modeling, logic and control, electrical systems, and, and human machine interface. And this bottom, this bottom uh, area, you know, the key is the models now need to be predictive. We're, we're designing everything based upon engineering information, and we have to come out with the right response. There's no plant data there to try and match and tune your simulator to. The simulator basically has to, to be able to predict how the plant's going to behave. And the only way to do that is to ensure that the underpinning technology that you're using is going to support that, uh, that level of detailed information that you need. From an INC design platform, you know, we've come up with something we call Control Sim, which is a, a platform that integrates uh, the logic and control design tools, the man-machine interface design tools, and a very robust and, and fully integrated information management system that, uh, that not only is uh, information management, but configuration management system uh, as the plants change. So as we're building our simulator during plant construction, obviously uh, data comes in, in, uh, in buckets to us, not all at once. And we have to be able to manage the changing information uh, and, and do that in a very uh, robust and seamless way for the customers. So the control sim environment is also used by some of our customers as they are trying to take more control over design of, of the plant INC. So the same set of tools that we would use to simulate uh, the plant INC, the customers are using to do that top level design you know, developing the base icons, the, the control logic design, creating the IO list, the, the AutoCADs, the set point definitions, and basically coming out with a, a DCS specification. And all the time, we're bouncing those designs against the simulator and the dynamic models to ensure that the strategy is going to work and the implementation of the, uh, of the control system uh, is going to result in, in uh, what they expect. So again, just an idea about you know the the different types of things that we look for. You know the interaction between safety and non-safety systems, the interaction between uh, control room and non-control room operations, and then again ensuring whether the logic and control has been implemented correctly. And the next slide gives you an idea of of the experience we have gained 
both in nuclear and in thermal power as we've used simulation to test out the DCS systems. And these are the, the typical types of problems and it's unfortunately not just one or two that we find. You know, it it's, tends to be hundreds depending on the stage of the project we're in. And, you know, whether it's incorrect permissives that would, that would prevent equipment from starting up, you know, incorrect tags, uh, loops not connected, it, it's a wide variety, oftentimes not big mistakes. And if we can find them on the simulator, they're easy, relatively easy and relatively inexpensive to find. If you're trying to uh, find these during plant commissioning, it's obviously the most expensive time you could be trying to, to solve these problems. So using the simulator, you know, just, just makes a lot of sense. From a human factors perspective, <clears throat> there's a lot of different things we've been able to do using the simulator. One is the, the layout of some of these new control rooms. So whether, again, we're talking going from an analog control room to a fully digital or hybrid control room, you know, what information do we have uh, in the control room? If we look at some of the new small modular reactors where a single control room may have up to 12 different reactors being operated, um, you know, the paradigm is shifting. You know, how many, how many reactors can a single operator uh, manage? So using the simulator has helped some of these companies determine what that optimal number is. And more importantly, it will help them convince the regulators that that, uh, that change in operating philosophy is still going to be safe and effective. But back to the details that we tend to uncover using the simulator from a human factors point of view is, is where should the information show up? You know, how much information should we have? What's the, what's the navigation through what will likely be hundreds of DCS screens? And you know, the density of information, the concern about information overload. In the old days, it was very difficult to change the information provided to the operator within a control room. Now with a DCS, there's you know, hundreds of thousands of bits of information that, could, that uh, potentially could be presented. So what is that right information? And how easily can the operator diagnose and resolve a problem? You know, how many clicks does it take to find out what's really going on in your plant? We now have new modern uh, alarm management systems. What's the role of the, the shift supervisor? You know, what information does he have readily available and how do we share that information across the entire control room? A big push now for electronic procedures and how we interface with them. And then as I said before, you know, not only is it uh, getting it, uh, getting the operators comfortable with these new designs, but it's also getting the regulators comfortable with these designs. So a few examples of things that we've been doing here in the United States with the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission is developing uh, human machine interface designs connected to existing simulators so the regulators themselves can get a better appreciation for how these plants will be run and what their role is in, in regulatory space. And the uh, same thing with uh, uh, other aspects of the US NRC and Idaho National Lab. And you know, th this is the why we feel somewhat qualified in talking about this, and we've been working on a lot of what we'll call first of an engineering simulator projects, whether they be nuclear or non-nuclear. Uh, Westinghouse AP1000 and the simulators that we're building with them uh, for the Haiyang and Sanmen plants uh, in China, as well as the, the Vogel and Scana plants here in the United States, working with several different small modular reactor uh, design companies, whether it be New Scale, uh, B&W Power the uh, Cary Smart Reactor from Korea, and uh, what used to be the Pebble Bed Modular Reactor out of South Africa before, uh, before that project um, was terminated. We're also working in non-nuclear space, and again, bringing, bringing the experience that we've gained in, in the process and in the thermal power industry, you know, adds some value when we're talking about DCS integration human factors and uh, using simulation for design B and D, even in the nuclear space. Uh, you know, one example is uh, using the, our simulation technology to help do DCS uh, B and D for the Chinese CPR 1000 design. Uh, so we use our simulator to help design the, the control strategy, the human machine interface, the automated procedures. Uh, as you can see from that third dash, you know, we went through extensive revisions of the DCS in order to come up with the, the final design that they felt would, uh, would really work. 
and again automated the plant procedures and understood how to do that. The project was a really a raving success and the customer got a lot of value out of it and we kind of continued uh, taking the next steps with that customer in implementation of, of simulation uh, for V&V and, and helping them with their design processes. Some of the, the success factors, just a little bit of a wrap up is again using the engineering grade predictive models is, is key when you're trying to really understand whether how the plant's going to behave, uh, whether the procedures are going to work, how the operator is going to interface, whether the DCS is, has been designed and, and implemented correctly. But it's also important that we look at the different relationship between the vendor and the contractor. Again, in the old days of building a simulator, the customer would give us a truckload of data and we'd go off and design a plant. You know, now we get that data in an iterative fashion and we have to do more of a spiral design approach, which means we have to have a lot more coordination uh, with, our, with our customer, a lot more flexibility in the design and how we schedule things and how things happen than have ever been required in the past. But we've also noticed it, it also provides a, a benefit to our customers in really helping their different engineering departments, whether it be design or instrumentation and control, it, it almost forces them to, to work together where in the past they may not have had to, but in order to achieve the objectives of the simulation project, uh, really looking at it as a, an integrated team approach between GSE and the various engineering organizations uh, really is, is a, uh, a real key to that success. And then obviously, you know, our experience in, in doing full scope simulators across a variety of design platforms gives us the benefit to provide some, some valuable engineering insight uh, to our customers and, and to that partnership relationship. So bottom line is, you know, the kind of the value of, of using the simulator in, in this um, aspect you know, it really comes down to how do you drive risk out of a project? How do you drive cost out of a project by using the simulator to, to validate, you know, uh, both the, the plant processes, equipment sizing, things like that, uh, control systems, human machine interface, and, and the human factors engineering uh, plant procedures. And really, you know, the, the bottom line is the bottom line, you know, identify and correct design flaws, you know, as early as we can in the design process when it's the least expensive time to, to try and correct them. So with that, I thank you for your participation and uh, be happy to answer any questions that anybody has. Yeah, perfect, uh, Jill. Thank you so much for your for your presentation. We have a, a question from the Tsinghua University, a research associate. He uh, wants to ask us on how events like Fukushima and Daiichi uh, affected the improvement and development of, of, of full-scope simulators? Well, I, th I think it has, has caused us to rethink you know, some of the operating paradigms. So, for example, some of the things that we've seen happening here in the United States, even before the regulatory mandate has dictated what will happen, is we're starting to see customers looking at certain plant models and particularly if their plant simulator had been built many, many years ago, they're looking at more robust, uh, for example, electrical system modeling. So the, the practice or the theory in past had often been, uh, you know, that we would, we would go with off, without uh, site power for um, a certain period of time and your, your simulator may have to run for eight hours or 12 hours. Now we're looking at events where you might have to run your simulator 72 hours. And during that process, you have to really design, uh, understand what the effect is of operating decisions on battery life and electrical buses around the plant and what decisions you can make to extend the useful life of, of key equipment. So now we're, we're starting to, I have been for over the past uh, couple of years, providing much more detailed electrical system modeling down to a much lower level within the plant than was ever required before from purely operator training. You know, more robust uh, containment system models, uh, potentially using MAP 
not only for uh, the severe accident and beyond design basis uh, scenarios, but also in normal operations, we're starting to see that. You know, the next generation uh, will start uh, more actively modeling spent fuel pools and things. So we, we see kind of the need to do some basic upgrading of some of the simulators that are out there once the regulatory environment here, particularly in the United States, gets a little bit clearer, we will see, you know, the introduction potentially of, of MAP or MELCOR or other uh, severe accident codes embedded within the, the full scope simulator. Um, and we, we actually see probably more interest and activity in that regard outside of the United States than we do with, with U.S. utilities at the moment. Perfect. He also wants to know, is a little bit focused about the business, but um, basically he wants to know if, if, if the demand of, of the full scope simulators around the world is being increased due to these events. Uh, I, I didn't quite hear what, what has been increased due to the events. Basically the demand of uh, full scope simulators around the world. Uh, I mean, the use of, of full scope simulators has has been a uh, a well adopted best practice, you know, for the past uh, you know I'm, I'm going to say 20 years. Obviously, in the United States after Three Mile Island, and, and more worldwide after um, Chernobyl, I, I think what we're seeing is the the understanding that the role plays of the simulator plays uh, differently than just from an operator training perspective. You know, on the one hand, you know, there are certain areas of the world that continue to develop uh, nuclear power quite robustly, whether it be in China and Russia and some other emerging markets, whereas, you know, in, in Germany, uh, just the opposite has happened uh, so far. So um, I don't, I, I can't say that the event of, uh, of Fukushima has increased the demand because I think that, that demand has always been there. I think what we're seeing is the potential addition of of simulators for customers that were using one simulator to train on two units. I think the throughput is uh, is increasing and the fact that we're now using simulators to train more than just operators but engineers and management and others, the, the need for more simulator time has uh, forced or has, uh, has allowed some customers to decide to build a second full scope simulator. Um, so if they've got two units that were nearly identical and could use one full scope simulator, they're now looking at that investment of another full scope simulator in order to, to provide more training throughput. Uh, well, I think it's, it's, it's clear. We have another question from CMPS Corporation. They want to know a little bit more about uh, the development of uh, full scope simulators for AP1000 in China by GSE, of course. Well, uh, so I, can, I can tell you things that are in the public domain. So uh, I think we announced many years ago that we had signed a cooperative uh, venture with, with uh, Westinghouse to be their provider of the full scope simulators for the AP1000 plants. And the first two uh, projects that we have underway are for the, the Sandman and Haiyang plants uh, in China. And I think there's been information out about uh, the fact that uh, the simulators, uh, you know, one is has been uh, fully accepted and is used in training and the other is, is very near to that. There's a, a slight difference in the, the project schedules between those two plants, uh, both from a plant uh, construction point of view and from a simulator point of view. And, and GSE also built a second simulator again to help provide more throughput for training for um, the operators in, in uh, at the high young plant. So the, the kind of the working relationship with with uh, Westinghouse is has been very good. They they've used the simulator for basically each of the aspects that I just discussed. We started off using the simulator for uh, human factors engineering of the control room, and it's still being used to again validate and verify implementation of the control systems. So the GSE scope of supply is the dynamic modeling of the of the plant models, and the Westinghouse scope of supply is the the hardware and the INC system. And uh, so we've been 
we've been working hand in glove with with Westinghouse uh, for for many years now and, and providing these simulators. Perfect. I think it's also clear. And we have a last question from the Giaton University. And well, basically, it's what is the difference in terms of regulation and restriction to work? Uh, developing well, full scope simulators here in China and in your opinion what will be good to be improved in these terms? Uh, well I mean from a, a simulator standards point of view I really don't see much of a, a difference at all. Um, you know there's a, there's a well adopted I'll say minimal standard for nuclear power plant simulator design, which is the uh, ANS 3.5 standard. So most people adopt that. Some, some request uh, a higher fidelity solution, but that, that is the minimum. So, so all of the simulators, I think, being built around the world uh, pretty much meet that standard by any of the vendors. I, I'd, hate, I'd hate to say, you know, from a regulatory point of view, you know, what the differences are between uh, the China regulatory environment and the U.S. regulatory environment, uh, just because I'm I'm not an expert in that. But if uh, if the colleague with the question uh, would like to to uh, stop by and, and visit us during the conference, uh, we will have some experts there that that might have an opinion on that. 